Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Turn into the book of Ephesians, please. Ephesians, we've got a lot of verses to look at today. We uh, want to make sure that we cover what is necessary. We're going to start with these passages here and then move on. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26 Ephesians 4:26 and 27 Be angry and do not sin do not let the sun go down on your anger verse 27 says and give no place no opportunity no foothold to the devil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord God, this morning for your grace and your favor. We pray that you would meet each and every need here, the individual needs that each person carries with them. We pray that you would minister and help and set free. God, we ask corporately together as the body of Christ that you would empower us to do great works for you and that we would make a difference in our communities and our places of employment and that as a church, Lord God, we would be a lighthouse, a testimony of your goodness and your grace. God, we pray for souls, backsliders to come to know you, for those Christians who are drifting and wandering and have not yet found a place to to plant themselves and to grow. Lord, let this be their home. Help us to develop as ministers to be able to see that happen. Lord, we bind the strategies of darkness, the evil, the corrupt influences of this age. We come against with the power and the authority of you, Lord God, and we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for victory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. title of my message this morning is Stand My Ground. Stand my ground. I preached a while back out of one chronicles on defending your spiritual ground, and I'd like to look at another aspect of that with you this morning. The Bible tells us in verse 27 of our text that we should give no ground to the devil. The word, as you've heard probably oodles of times if you've been a Christian, is the Greek word topos. It's the word we get topography from. It talks about the lay of the land and the ground, the geography of the place. It's basically saying that we should give no topos, no piece of land, no spiritual beachhead to the devil. That tells us a couple of things. One, that it's possible for that to happen. It's possible for us as believers sitting here in church worshiping God uh, to allow the enemy not complete control over our lives, but just a little spot, just a little area of our hearts and our minds that can stop us from flourishing as the people of God. It's the people of God. And this is why it's important that we look at this and learn how to stand our ground. And I've entitled it, Stand My Ground. And the reason I use that word, my, to make it personal, because if it's not personal, if you look at it like, well, we as Christians should stand our ground, or the church should stand their ground, or spiritual leaders should stand their ground, then it really makes no difference in your life, and we can never uh, stand the ground that we need to. You have to take it personally. You have to decide that I'm going to not allow Satan to take my spiritual parcel, my spiritual possession. Because you own things as a Christian. You possess things as a Christian. You have things. 
Those of you that got something new as a gift for your birthday or a Christmas gift or you saved money and purchased something that you liked, you would not leave your window open or your car door open or your bag sitting out freely for someone just to come and pilfer it. You would not do that. You would guard it because you think it's valuable. Same thing needs to be true with our spiritual lives. And I don't want to get off on this. I just want to say one thing, though, that sometimes we look at our Christian lives because we've accepted grace, favor that we get from God, and forgiveness that he so freely shows us, the everlasting love that he pours into our life. We feel like, ah, well, if I let the devil steal something, I'll just come back to God and he'll forgive me and everything will be fine. You know, I don't want to deny or diminish the powerful grace of God and the free love that he gives But I do want to tell you that that is wrong thinking right there. Because every time Satan steals, something happens. Something happens. You might be able to get that thing back, but you're left scarred. I've pastored in only urban areas my entire pastorate. For 30 plus years, I pastored only urban areas. And I know what urban areas are like. And I know what it's like to be in places where uh, people come and they steal things. And I know people who had their car broke into dozens of times. I know other individuals, families who lived in one place their whole life and had their home ransacked uh, on numerous occasions. And you know what happens is they become jaded. They become to where it's like, well, just another thing. There you go. Yeah, we, they, they broke in again last night, Pastor. Well, yeah, they stole my kids, you know, uh, uh, game console, and they, they, that we'll have to save to buy another. And they just, you know, it's like nothing. And something happens after so many thieves break in. Same thing happens to us spiritually when we allow the devil to begin to come into our lives so many times is it begins to make us hard. And that's why I want you to take this to heart today so that you can see how you can not allow the devil in. You can make some changes in your life so that those hard areas of your life will become soft and fruitful once again. So let's start off with how do we lose spiritual ground in the first place? How do we lose spiritual ground? ground. Well, it's a lot easier than you think, that's for sure. It's a lot easier than you think, and it comes through multifaceted ways. So let me just say that we lose spiritual ground by, first of all, giving up our public ground. I've been reading from a man who was talking about this and saying we give up public ground. Because Jesus is not welcomed in our world. If you're a Christian, mostly uh, you go out into your school system and say, I believe in Christ and Christianity and I want to live morally. They will poo-poo that. They will put that down. They will say that that's not a good thing. If you begin to say, I want to pray in the name of Jesus in a public arena, often you will be told you can't. But if you're from some other religion that's considered uh, uh, one that needs to be uh, allowed, uh, then they allow that. In the world, uh, the morality that has been the, the, the stalwart points of our Christian value system in uh, Western societies are, are now being eroded by new laws that are being passed uh, concerning family and marriage, uh, concerning our Christianity. Even some of the building codes are being changed so that people that want to start churches cannot because governments say no. We as Christians need to say, wait a minute, hold on here. We're not trying to turn this into a Christian thing, but we are also citizens of Manchester. We are also citizens of this country. We also deserve uh, just what you give to everybody else. You talk about equal rights, but boy, they sure seem biased. (laughs) They try to stop prayer in schools. They try to stop any kind of display of any kind of Christianity. And I want to tell you, we have rights, and we need to be able to say to this world, hey, wait a minute, I'm not going to give up any more ground. I will make a stand outside of my church. Because some people say, well, you can do that in your church. Well, you know, man, people in my neighborhood, drunk at night, carousing late at night, young people whiffing cans of whatever aerosol things they're doing, huffing to get high. 
all kinds of things that take place and all of that is like just overlooked. I'm here to tell you that if they're doing all of that, I want to be able to display my Christianity wherever I like. Praise God. We've also given up in an area, and I think that this is of critical importance, is parental ground. Parental ground. Because if you think about it, you know, I was reading about uh, a girl. Uh, she's, I, I forget her name, and I wish I would have remembered her name, but she is uh, 23 years old, and she is the number one R&B singer in the U.S. She's from England, but she's the number one R&B singer in the U.S. She's not very popular here yet, but she's taking the U.S. by, by storm. And uh, the date that she uh, was born was a date that I was in Liverpool pastoring. Made me think, I go, people that are born in this time are going to make influence in the world in less than 10, 15, 20 years. What you do with your children is going to affect the future. It's going to affect the future. It's hard to see it because it takes so long, doesn't it? It seems like it takes long when kids are small. And we often are busy with our own lives, and so we often, it very, becomes very easy to neglect our parenting responsibility. I was reading one Christian leader that says that all the members in his congregation have lost control of their children. Few parents begin to exercise biblical authority over their children anymore. This is what we see happening in the world. They tend to uh, ignore what the Bible teaches, especially when it concerns discipline, which is from the time that your child is basically born and old enough to understand till the time that they're uh, young teenagers. Uh, they need to be con not controlled in terms of kept and, and, and kept in a box, but shaped and formed and guided down the right path. And so the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. So the question is, do we believe that? You may say, well, what is the rod of discipline? I'm just going to leave that up to you. I'm just going to leave that up to you to decide. I know that it, talking about something authoritative, though, that's for sure. Those who love their children, Proverbs 13, 24 says, care enough to discipline them. Care enough to train them. And if you don't train them in the small things, you can't expect them to obey in the big things. We've given up this parental ground. Proverbs 19.18 begins to uh, provoke us and inspire us and challenge us to make sure that we live and understand that there is a, a, a t window of time in which children can be taken care of and encouraged. Discipline your children while there is hope, it says. Because that implies that there'll come a place where there is no hope for being able to recapture the youth of your child and help them. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives, Proverbs 19.18 says. Discipline your children while there is hope, otherwise you will ruin their lives. Proverbs 22.15 really goes against the grain of the world on this. It says, a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness. We all know who've raised kids know that young kids are filled with foolishness, but the world says, oh no, they're filled with all kinds of ideas. They're filled with all kinds of beautiful things. Maybe when they get older, but when they're young, they're filled with foolishness. I was filled with foolishness. You were filled with foolishness. You were filled with mischievousness. You were filled with deviousness. You were filled with... Oh, man, I could go on with a lot of words that end with the suffix N-E-S-S. -S. <laughs> I want to tell you that we are filled with that. And the Bible says in Proverbs twenty-two fifteen, a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but discipline will drive it far away. This is why we have to learn to exercise discipline. Pastor, what kind of discipline? Look at it. You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. You're going to have to decide what that means. You're going to have to make decisions between you and your spouse on how that's going to be executed. But I want to tell you something, that without that, you're going to see problems later on. And sometimes things change. Beautiful little children are good for a number of years, and all of a sudden now that deviousness comes into their heart and they begin to do things that requires you to now change tactics midstream. This parental ground is so 
important. And you know, it doesn't end once they get older. As a matter of fact, as they begin to move into a, adulthood, it's very important for you as a parent that you begin to change gears. You can't, you know, control your children as they become teenagers in the sense of like control every thought. Obviously, if they're living in your home, you control certain things. You do not allow them to do certain things if they're going to stay in your home. But you can't mentally manipulate your kids as they get older. You have to understand that they're, par- that they're adults and growing up into that adulthood. We need to recapture this parenting ground. I really probably need to preach a whole message. I keep saying that every time I preach. But I wanted to bring this out, parental ground. I think we also need to learn how to, when we lose ground, we lose spiritual ground, when we give up praying ground. Whether you like it or not, there is a certain element of spiritual dominion that takes place when you pray. You begin to, and and I can't explain it simply because it's not simple It's not very easy to understand. It's not like one plus one equals two. All I know is that when people pray consistently, they begin to establish a greater dominion of spirituality, a greater godliness in their life and in their home. And when they pull back from that, they lose that ground. You can tell when a church is on fire and they're all praying together and you're seeing God do things little by little. Things begin to happen. You can see that. You can also sense when people pull back from that and they're no longer in that mode or they're just in that mode but they're just doing it religiously, just ceremonially. They're just doing it because they have to do it. I'm here to tell you that we need to re- capture this area of praying ground because the problem with prayer is it's like dieting. You do it, but you don't see results right away, so it's easy to quit. Isn't that true? It's like working out, you know. You want to see results right away, but it takes time. I remember, Grace, we had a, uh, uh, where we lived in California, we had, it was like a set of uh, condominiums like apartment kind of things and they had like a central area that had a pool and a little room with a weight machine in there and uh, Gracie was telling me about when she walked by there she saw this one kid he was probably about 13 years old and he's like ripping on those weights like this which those that lift weights know that's not the way you lift weights but this is what he was doing and then he would stop and go to the mirror and go (laughs) and he was looking like he did 40 of these, and all of a sudden now something's going to grow. Sometimes that's how we, well, I prayed for this, and nothing happened. Well, I prayed a week. I prayed a month. How about praying a decade? Can you pray a decade? Because some things take that. The great George Mueller, the leader of great orphanages here in the U.K., prayed for his father his entire life to get saved. He didn't get saved till two years after Mueller's death. But that prayer made impact. He prayed his entire life to see one thing happen. How about us? See, we often give up, and I don't have this on the screen, but we often give up our ground because we have ignorance of things. We're ignorant of how Satan works. We're ignorant of the fact that the Bible tells us that Satan can outsmart us. That's possible. We're ignorant of the fact that he will have evil schemes formed against us. He has plans and strategies, and we just kind of walk through life willy-nilly and not thinking anything about it, and we're ignorant of that, and we give up ground, and that's why those things become easy just to let dissipate into the background of our lives. And I'm here to tell you today that we can't be ignorant of what Satan's strategies are. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, that Satan is able to disguise himself as an angel of light. This doesn't mean we should walk around going, hey, is that the devil? Is that the devil? No, don't, don't do that. Just be aware that if you're in prayer, if you're aware you're in prayer, man, I'm rhyming. I'm a hip-hop artist, man. I'm the plain white rapper, man. (laughs) 
I actually have a rep. I told you that before. One of these days, I'm going to do it for you. Y'all won't even know what's up. (laughs) Satan has strategies formed against our lives. Sometimes we're ignorant of our Savior. We don't even know our God that we claim to uh, live for, who is our, our, our King and our Lord. You know, the Bible tells us that in the book of Luke, chapter 4 and verse 18, that he came for those who are brokenhearted. He came for those who are downtrodden. He came for those who are blinded. He's able to do great things in their lives. And sometimes we act as if we're, we're poor and beggars in God. We don't recognize that we are his children and that we have power and now we have authority and that yes we might be going through some hardships at the moment but those are just momentary hardships Uh, those are just temporary conditions Uh, God has great things for us but when we're ignorant of that fact we give up these grounds and we begin to allow Satan in our lives so here's the question that you should be asking is how do we regain spiritual ground Well, let me start off before I get into this, that it's not going to be through any, you know, new concoction that some preacher, you know, uh, conceived of. It's not through some new method. It might need to become fresh to us, alive, and feel brand new. But it's old truths that are important. See, It's going to cost you something to regain ground. Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to pay the price? See, we'll pay the price for certain things. Well, some people won't. They're just cheap on everything. You know those kind of people? That number one factor in any purchase is cost. Now, of course, we all know that cost is important. We have to always check the price of things. We have to always see if this is within our budget. But if you're just, first thing you, when you decide to purchase something, you look at cost, I guarantee you, you're probably going to get the worst product or at least less than best product. Yes, that factors in, but cheapness never works. And sometimes when we come to our Christianity, we want the quick and easy thing. What's the cheapest thing I can do? What can I do right now? How can I do it? That's why people go from meeting to meeting and church to church and, you know, some new guru comes out with the latest fad and fancy thing to be able to get somebody delivered and their people are running and flocking to them. Some new program hits the town and they think, oh, this is it. I'm finally going to get my breakthrough. I'd like to tell you there's nothing new under the sun, the book of Ecclesiastes says. Uh, I'm here to tell you it's the old truths that stand firm and fast, but there is a cost. There is a price. We regain spiritual ground, first of all, through repentance. Repentance. I know it's an old-fashioned word. And I know that in our modern society it's not very acceptable. They usually display guys like me, preachers who talk about this word repent or repentance as some, you know, wild-eyed, bushy-haired freak that telling repent, doomsday, you know, which is the way the world does things. If you're looking to be able to recapture the public ground or the parental ground or any kind of spiritual ground in your life, you can't do it through worldly methods. God's method has always been through repentance. As you begin to look through the Bible, you'll begin to see words like return to me, come back to me, repent, turn, uh, do the things that you did at first. Uh, You'll see this uh, as a theme throughout Scripture. And it's totally critical for us uh, to become people who understand repentance. I mean, think about it. How many times have you really repented? I mean, really repented. Yeah, I'm talking to you that have been saved a lot of years. Yeah. How many times have you repented in the last year? I mean, came before God and said, God, uh, I've really done something wrong. To the point where it got beyond your hard exterior. And you begin to say, you know what, this is what I need. How many of you, just when I was talking about parenting, thought, man, you know, I really need to make some changes in this area, but you're going to have to repent of your 
previous works. Repentance. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 30, as the apostles of the time, the disciples of the time were trying to talk them about Old Testament versus New Testament, how things are changed now. He makes this statement in the book of Acts, chapter 17 and verse 30. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. And that's the key essence of repentance, isn't it? It's not just making an altar call, though altar calls are a brilliant way to get started. But you start here and you say, yes, I'm sorry, God forgive me. And you lay out the issues of your heart and you're real with him. But it doesn't stop there. The Bible tells clearly we turn to him now. And that's where I think a lot of Christians miss it is that they, yes, say, I'm sorry, yes, I've done something wrong, but their repentance is shallow because they never come to God and say, I need you, God, and they begin to now dig in the Word and begin to get back to prayer and begin to reinforce those disciplines that they know to be true. I think it's totally critical and often missed. We're going to have to be humble if we're going to pray. I mean, if we're going to repent Pray the prayer of repentance. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Do you even know that God's hand is mighty? Because so often, this is what happens when you've lost spiritual ground. God is just some... some uh, concept. It's not, he has a mighty hand. He can crush me at any time. Not that he would crush you, but he can crush you. If you refuse to repent, well, now all bets are off on that one. Humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. We need to understand repentance, but we also have to understand another word that I use a lot in preaching and I like it. It's the word renewal. It's the word renewal. That we can be people who are renewed. Turn with me in your Bibles into the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. You know, all of the Bible is important and all of the Bible is profitable, but certain texts uh, are important because they're kind of like cornerstone texts. They're, 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 they're texts that have to be come back to over and over again and have to be foundational in our walk with God, and this is one of them. This is one that you could preach sermon after sermon on these because well, there's so many things that are there that are necessary for us to grow. And here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1... It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Before we read that rest of the verse, how many of us really give our bodies to God? We give our souls to God. We talk about giving our hearts to God, and that's important, and that's uh, definitely a theme in the Bible. But we don't think about giving our bodies to God, our entire beings to God. And that's what the Scripture is pleading with us to do. And here's why. Because, he has, because of all he has done for you. And that's why we do it. That's why we say, God, I'm going to yield myself over to you. I mean, I could talk a long time, and I'm not going to take the time about why is the word body used and what does that mean effectually in our lives, but it definitely means that we use our bodies uh, in the way that he ordained them to be used, not the way that we want to use them. It means that we yield over our members to him. We give them to Him. That means we use holy hands to worship Him. That means we use our tongue and our lips and our mouth for the things that God ordained them to be. It means we should bring our bodies into a place where the Bible says we gather together in His name. 
We do things like kneel and we do things like stand and we do things like lie and prostrate in front of him. And the reason is is because we're yielding our bodies to him. We, the brothers that came and worked to be able to fix the uh, uh, floor, that was yielding bodies over for God's work. This is what the scripture is talking about here. It goes deep, well, far deeper than that, but I just wanted to give you a little flavor of it. It says, let them be a living and holy sacrifice. That means the yielding over of our bodies, the yielding over of our beings to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, not just some token sacrifice, not some limited sacrifice. Renewal requires that we give him the kind of sacrifice that he will find acceptable. Scripture goes on to say this is truly the way we way to worship him. <laughs> we um, have often on uh, Christian television in our house, you know, listening to different people speak. Uh, I warn you, be careful of who you listen to on television, you know. Some crazy nuts out there, I'll tell you that. Uh, but one of the things that I've noticed is a big difference from the time when we were brand new Christians till now is that there's lots of worship and praise on Christian television. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, lots of bands that do worship concert, and you know it's nice, especially if you have good sound, you can hear that, and it's great, and that's worship. But sometimes uh, one of our problems, though, is that we've kind of limited that to being good worship that it's just about music and feeling and sensation. And there's nothing wrong with that. We need that. We have to develop that and definitely get into that kind of worship. But that's only one flavor of worship. There's other segments of worship that the Bible's talking about here. Every time you yield your body for God, that's worship. And the Bible says to do this the true way, the way that he wants to be worshipped. Sometimes, and, and again, not critical of of praise and worship, but sometimes it's more like we're getting off on it. We're enjoying it, and there's nothing wrong with that either, but that doesn't mean the, that means that we're not focused on the person who should be getting the worship, and that's God. We do it not for how we feel, but how he does. Verse 2, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we're talking about renewal here, regaining spiritual ground. We repent and then we renew. Verse 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person. (laughs) We'll read the rest in just a minute. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world. I'm not talking about extreme things like some people say, well, you know, musicians of the world play the guitar a certain way that we shouldn't play the guitar a certain way. That's nonsense. That has nothing to do with what the scriptures say. It's talking about the moral behaviors, the, the spiritual customs of the world. The m- most uh, prevalent behavior in the world today is anti-God that God doesn't exist, that God's unimportant, or God's simply some religious concept. We, we reject that. And we're not going to copy that more. People are rejecting marriage and saying marriage and family are unimportant. As long as we love one another, that's good. We reject that because the Bible says something different. The Bible says it's okay for same sex to sleep together and have sex together as long as they love one another. I'm here to tell you that that's a behavior and a custom of the world that the Bible does not embrace. And us as believers embrace what the Bible does. Don't copy. That's how we get renewal. Because here's what happens when you give up public ground, parental ground, and praying ground. Is you begin to pull back and allow these things to creep into your life little by little. It's not apparent at first. It's just before you know it, it's there. 2005, I had some health issues, and so I really started watching my eating, the food to try to eat healthier. I uh, was doing a lot of exercising, and then right on top of that, I had a lot of seeking of God, and so I had really lost uh, quite a bit of weight in 2005, and, you know, that was, it wasn't my purpose to lose weight. I just wanted to get back to some health there, but I had lost weight, and then, you know, the health scare kind of goes away, you know, and... Uh, you know, the, the, you feel healthy and strong. You just rely on your machismo man to be strong. And before you know it, it's like, man, my belt was a little tight. 
And I thought, man, where is this coming from? Before you know it, it's like I looked at my belt, and you know, you can see the lines on your belt where you change the hole, you know, and now the mark that was here is now over here. And so now there's a couple of lines where I used to have my belt. Now it's enlarged. And it would seem like, wow, I went from being this size to being this size, and it just crept up in no time. And that's how the morals and behavior of the world happens. Before you know it, you're no longer slim for him. <laughs> Can you say amen? Amen. <laughs> That was a blast from the past, that slim for him, I'll tell you that. See, we have to understand that we need to renew our lives daily by watching the moral behaviors that we have. It says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Some of us who have been Christians a long time, we need our behavior to be totally revolutionized. You're still stuck in this little uh, um, uh, narrow view of God's word when God is trying to expand, expand your thinking concerning some things, to enlarge your vision, to encompass things that you never encompass, not compromising exactly the opposite. Being able to find new and uh, beneficial ways to do worship to God, to reach people. Are you with me? It says, then you will know, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Some of us, that's our problem. That's why we've given us spiritual ground, is we've got outside of the will of God, and we need to get back into the will of God. So here's how we gain it. Now, how do we guard it? Because it is important that we guard our spiritual ground. (laughs) I must guard my spiritual ground. Well, it starts with Proverbs 4.23. It's an old-fashioned verse. It's one of those cornerstone verses I was talking about. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. If your walk has gone astray, your heart's gone astray. Whichever way your heart goes, that's the way you're going to go. If you're riding a bicycle, you know that whichever way you lean, that's the way the bike's going to go. You know whichever way you look, that's the way it's going, your, your, your bicycle will go. And the reality is that's how it is for our lives, how our heart goes, there goes our lives. And so maybe once you repent and once you get into a process of renewal, now you need to guard it. It's not done. And I think that's where a lot of people get off. They come to a conference, they come to a a meeting, a a session of hearing about God's Word, they repent. Then they maybe start a process of renewal, but then they just kind of fade off and they never guard what God has given. Because the devil just doesn't say, wow, I stole from him and now he's got it right and now I'm not going to go back and steal again. No, he's going to go back because he looks at targets that he's been at before. Every thief in this place knows. Do we have any thieves? Don't tell me. But ex-thieves in this place, you know that if you find a good mark, you keep going after that mark. Because you know that's why houses, the same house in the neighborhood gets robbed over and over and over again. And even though they increase security, they keep going back. Satan keeps going back to you. He's not going to just stop. You must guard your heart. He's going to try to infiltrate it once again. The psalmist wrote in Psalms 141 verse 3, making a prayer to God. He says, Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Some of us need to have a guard over our mouths. Keep watch over the door of my lips. How many know our mouths get us in so much trouble? And our mouths are directly linked to our hearts. We know that. Many scriptures point to that. Sometimes our biggest problem is the fact that we guard our hearts to a degree, but we allow this running of the mouth. My dad had a crude statement to me when I was talking too much as a little kid. He says, you got diarrhea of the mouth. (laughs) Your dad would say anything parental ground, I guess, you know, (laughs) he gave that up a long time ago. My point is, is that we need to watch what we say. 
Because what we say affects things. Just think of this. Just as soon as you tell somebody this, I'm discouraged. How do you start feeling? More discouraged. Confessing to God is one thing. Talking about it to another. Oh, I'm going through this. Oh, my husband's this. My husband's that. My wife doesn't want to. And all these problems I got in my family. Guess what? Every time you go into your home, man, it just goes there because your mouth is saying things that is now infecting your heart. This is why we have to watch what we say. This is why he's praying because he realizes, you know, without God's help, his mouth is going to keep moving. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, then you will experience God's peace. How many need God's peace in their lives? Yes, you do. We all do which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. We as Christians should be seeking his peace so that guards the things that are in our hearts, the good things that God has given us. Can you say amen? So here we are. Stand my ground. My question is today, Will you stand your ground? In these areas that I spoke about, but there's loads more. But how about just starting with these that we spoke about? Will you learn to repent and work on repentance and renewal? And again, for those that have been Christians a long time, these are common things that you've been taught and heard of many times, but yet practice very little. And then probably one of the most important things is that we... Guard our spiritual ground. We guard it, protect it. If you had a lot of money in your pocket, you walk around with a different attitude when you're in a bad neighborhood. You start thinking, you see young lads coming up to you, they look a little bit dodgy, they've got a sketchy behavior going on there. And you in your, know it's in your pocket, maybe you put a hand in your pocket or you just walk a different way because you have something valuable in there. When you are broke, you're like, well, come get it, man. Ain't nothing in there. Do whatever you want. If you've got something valuable, your Christianity, if your spiritual life, if your blessings that you've received, if your church family, if your ministry, if all of these things are valuable to you, they need to be protected. We need to gain that spiritual ground back and guard it with all that we have. Let's bow our heads and go before the Lord here today. Heavenly Father, thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. We ask, Lord God, for continued favor upon our lives. Thank you, Lord, that your grace is sufficient. Thank you that you bless your people. Thank you that you love us beyond understanding and that your peace uh, that enters our hearts goes beyond even comprehension. But Lord, today, help us to live for you. And those that have given up, public ground their parenting responsibilities their prayer life has begun to diminish God let them repent seek renewal and help us all to guard our hearts and our lips and the things we say and do Lord we thank you in Jesus name If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, m 3 6 by We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you, we're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.